Hi, I'm George and welcome to part three of the Typhoon series. In this episode, we're going to have a look at construction of the pressure chamber. We'll also find out how the rocket got its name and also where Air Command got its name. And remember, if you have any questions about the build, please leave them in the comments below. We don't have a lot of time before the first launch, so let's get cracking. Okay, let's start on the main body tube. The body tube is just made from plain weave fiberglass. We decide not to go with the carbon fiber for this build as the fiberglass is much cheaper and the carbon fiber strength is just not needed. We mark a couple of lines on opposite sides of the mandrel to help us align the leading edge of the cloth. Wrapping the paper onto the mandrel took about 15 minutes to get it just right so there weren't any folds and the paper was nice and snug against the mandrel. With tubes this size, it's important to get help. It really takes four people to do this. We have one person mixing the epoxy, another person holding the end of the mandrel and is in control of rolling it when needed, and then two people rolling out the epoxy. With this large diameter rocket, we're rolling out about three and a half square meters or almost 40 square feet of cloth. When we put the second cloth strip on the mandrel, we start on the opposite side of the mandrel to try and even out the cloth overlaps. So that one side of the rocket is not stronger than the other, under pressure that could cause the airframe to warp. When all the cloth is rolled out, we put it on the rotisserie. The PVC mandrel itself has a very slight bend to it. The bend's exaggerated in this diagram to make it a bit clearer. After the epoxy has had a chance to gel, we stop the rotisserie so that the bend faces up, sitting up on the steel pipe. We then insert a long weight into the middle of the PVC pipe, which then straightens out that bend. We let the tube cure like this overnight, and then you end up with a straight tube. The next day, we can pull the tube off. It's a little bit more tricky because of that slight bend, but you can just wiggle it off. Again, careful mandrel and paper prep are essential to get the tube of this size to slide off easily. Pulling the paper also needs to be done very carefully because tearing it well inside the tube is a lot harder to remove. To make this easier, we insert a long dowel down the length of the tube and just start rolling. The paper then wraps itself onto the dowel, always pulling inwards towards the center, preventing tearing that might happen if you were just to pull it towards the ends. At this point, the trim tube weighs about 1.2 kilos and is just shy of two meters. There is a chance that the tube has several micro holes throughout the walls, uh, which would cause it to leak. So we need to coat the inside with a layer of epoxy. For this, we 3D printed a spreader that gets covered with a sock. We're using a sock because it doesn't have any seams, so the epoxy spreads evenly. The spreader is just tight enough so it touches all the way around, but not too tight so it doesn't scrape the epoxy. We use a second pole with a small spoon on the end of it that we can fill with epoxy. We then slowly pull this pole out while tipping the spoon so that we spread the epoxy along the length. As you rotate the tube, the glue then runs around the inside. This way we end up with a much more even spread. Then it's just a matter of running the spreader back and forth from both ends of the tube to spread the epoxy. If we see dry patches on the inside, we just use the pole with the spoon to deliver the epoxy to that spot. We then suspend the tube under the rotisserie in order to stop the epoxy pooling on one side. To seal the top of the pressure chamber, we make a top end cap. The top end cap is made the same way as we've done in other builds. We start off with a 3D printed mold and cover it with a couple of balloons. We put a super super light coat of silicon grease on the balloon before we put on the fiberglass sleeve. If you don't do this, the balloon sticks pretty well to the epoxy and then makes it a lot more difficult to remove. You don't want to use too much grease though because you want a good bond for the internal reinforcing that comes later. We compress the end of the sleeve with tape uh, as this helps drive out all the air bubbles near the transition.
Then we put a thin layer of fiberglass to smooth the coarser sleeve and help prevent any micro holes through the walls. This last layer at the base of the cap ensures a snug fit inside of the main body cube. You can adjust the length of this strip to get just the right kind of fit. We had to use a couple of wraps here. When it's all cured, we cut off the frayed end and then we just pull it off. The thicker coat of silicon grease between the two balloons makes this a lot easier. The single layer of sleeve isn't quite strong enough by itself, so we layer a whole bunch of gauze on the inside to give it strength and help reduce any leaks. This end of the end cap needs to be really strong because that's where the shock cord attaches. The end cap can then just be glued in to the end of the cube with a regular 24 hour epoxy. So we're going to have a little intermission, so let's find out where the rocket got its name. But for that we need to go way back, back into the early 60s and behind the Iron Curtain in Czechoslovakia. Their dad started up with a group of friends early scuba diving in Czechoslovakia and then progressed as an engineer to develop a whole bunch of scuba equipment from regulators and valves to test equipment and even uh, deep sea camera housings that went down to three kilometers. Now right around 1971 he helped design the regulator uh, called Typhoon. Uh, this regulator, I think they ended up selling about 30,000 units uh, and it was widely distributed uh, not only to commercial divers but also the Czech army ended up using it and at one point it was the most used regulator in all of Czechoslovakia. So that's how the rocket got its name and here it is. Uh, even after 50 years, it still works great, uh, although it's looking a little worn these days. So let's fast forward a little to 1979, when our family escaped Czechoslovakia into West Germany, and then nine months later, we arrived in sunny Australia. Two weeks after that, Dad joined another company that designed scuba equipment, and right around 1987, he developed a new regulator uh, that ended up being sold both locally and internationally. I think they made about 40,000 units, and it ended up being used by both the uh, Australian Navy clearance divers and also by the Australian police force because of its performance. So what was this regulator called? You might have guessed it, almost guessed it, it was called Command Air. And so when we started up our rocketry adventure about 17 years ago, we just took that name, swapped the two words, and we became Air Command Rockets. So there you have it. Uh, enough chit chat, let's get back to the build. The bottom end cap follows an almost identical process, except the mold is longer. If we went any bigger, we'd need bigger balloons. These are about at their limit as we broke a few putting them on. The other difference is that this end cap doesn't contain the nozzle like it normally would. Uh, we'll see that in a minute. The piece of wire helps to hold the sleeve in place while we stretch the tape over it. And again we wrap the bottom of the end cap to make it fit snugly into the main body cube. Now it's time to attach the bottom end cap to the motor cube. The original mold is used as an alignment jig to make sure that the motor cube and the end cap are aligned. We don't want any off axis thrust vectors. After the end cap is aligned on the mold, we cut off the end uh, as that was done purely for construction and something to attach the sleeve to. Then we insert this stainless steel rod with a couple of 3D printed spacers into the motor tube and insert it into the top of the mold. Now everything is nicely aligned and centered. The two parts are tacked together with 24 hour epoxy and left to cure overnight. The next day we start layering strips of 85 GSM glass over the joint. We use different sizes and also some are bias cut while others are straight cut to make sure that this joint is as strong as possible. There's at least 12 to 15 layers there. And we use progressively longer and longer strips to feather out the joint. 
The next day we can pull it off and then file down the inside of the joint so it's nice and smooth. I forgot to take the video of that. Like with the top end cap, the bottom end cap and motor can be glued together into the main body tube. The next day when it cures, the little step between the end cap and body tube can be filled in with epi glue. With just over two weeks to go before launch, we need to sand down the rocket. We're using wet and dry to keep the dust down and prevent the sandpaper from clogging up. To get any fine particles off the tube, we just hose it down. Next we have to prepare a 2 meter long strip of thin fiberglass cloth. This will be the outermost layer that makes sanding easier to get a nice smooth finish. Next we thread on the biaxial fiberglass sleeve. It gets cut to length, but we always leave a little bit extra even though the sleeve will stretch when it's pulled tight. Here we're inserting a tube into the top end cap that will help support the entire pressure chamber while we glass it and also allows us to attach the sleeve to it. Here you can see the sleeve attached to the top of the pressure chamber, but the other end is loose. This allows us to stretch the sleeve from the top towards the bottom. For this we only need three people, as it's much less cloth that we are wetting out. Inevitably there will always be some amount of folds in the sleeve. To get these out you simply squeegee them towards the loose end with your hands. You need to do this several times during the wetting out process. This also helps the epoxy penetrate deeper under the sleeve. The person at the end of the chamber needs to provide quite a bit of resistance when you squeegee it. The veil layering goes on next. I also find it useful to wear two pairs of gloves on top of each other so you can pull one set off and have clean gloves again to handle the next part. Your hands get sweaty and trying to put on clean set of gloves is pretty difficult. And the end caps also get four gauze each to smooth everything out. That tube sticking out from the top of the end cap uh, also lets us attach it to the rotisserie. The whole motor tube is wrapped in the sleeve and also overwrapped with electrical tape to compress it down. The next day the tape can be pulled off from both ends of the pressure chamber. and we can trim the ends to the right length. The length of the motor tube was chosen so that it provides enough support for various lengths of 54mm motors. So that's it for this week. In the next episode, we're going to have a look at more construction. We're going to build the fins and we're going to attach various bits and pieces to the rocket. Uh, but anyway, that's all for this week. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.